chapter four is really where the story of Jonah comes together. It's in this chapter that we begin to understand why Jonah really ran away and why Jonah could pray as he did so in the fish and yet still deliver a half-hearted eight-word sermon on the streets of Nineveh and why the revival and the repentance of the Ninevites could be reported in such an understated way. Chapter four is where we really begin to understand Jonah's thought process all along. And so let's read chapter four together. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die. And he said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jonah was angry. From the first moment that he heard God's call way back in chapter one, he had determined that a good God would not ask him to do this. A good God would not send him to Nineveh, to the place of his enemies. A good God would not ask him to warn his enemies that if they repent, they will be saved. And even more, a good God would not ask someone from Israel to go to Nineveh with that message. It wasn't right. It wasn't good. And it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair because Jonah had seen this play out before with the people of Israel. He knew the history of Israel and how often they had rebelled, but God sent a prophet. God spoke to them and the people listened and God forgave their wickedness and showed them his mercy and grace. And that was good. When it applied to Israel, it was good when it applied to God's people. It was good. God was good then. But, but when that kind of mercy and grace and love was to be extended to Nineveh, Jonah then began to wonder what he had to do to stop God. Because if God was going to do that, If God was going to show grace and love and compassion to them when they didn't deserve it and when they didn't have the right credentials and when their ancestors couldn't be traced back in the same way to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, then Jonah wasn't so sure that God was good after all. So that's why Jonah ran away in the first place. That's why he set sail for Tarshish as far away from Nineveh as he could get. That's why he went down into the belly of the ship, even before the ship took off, hoping that that God might not see him in that place. He wanted to protect God and to protect God's reputation 
from himself. That's why Jonah could pray about God's goodness and faithfulness in the fish and yet still deliver his eight word sermon without any passion. He knew that, that he had to obey, but he wanted to stop God from being not good. And that's why Jonah left the city as soon as he had proclaimed his message. He didn't want to be around to answer their questions or help guide them in their relationship with God. Instead, he went out and he sat on a hill overlooking the whole city, waiting for the revival in the city to inevitably die down and for people to return to their previous ways. Hopefully, Jonah thought, within the 40-day window so that he would have a front row seat to Nineveh's destruction. Because if that happened, God would be good, Jonah thought. The only way that that Jonah saw that God could be good was to give the Ninevites what he so clearly knew they deserved. For every nation that they had punished and tortured and wiped off the map, they deserved the same in return. Nineveh deserved to be punished. For the evil ways that they used to hold on to their power, Jonah surmised that they deserved to be treated just as Sodom and Gomorrah were treated in the time of Abraham, with sulfur and fire raining down from heaven, a clear sign of God's judgment and and power and vindication for Israel. And so as the sounds of revival continued to echo out of the city, And as the 40 days came and went, meaning that God had relented from destroying Nineveh, Jonah's anger festered. How could you, God? He screamed. And listen to what Jonah says in verse two. Isn't this what I said when I was still at home? This, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I know that you are a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Here Jonah is telling God, I was trying to protect you. I was trying to help you be good. I was trying to help you do the right thing. And now you've messed it up. So now take away my life or it would be better for me to die than to live. Let me die, Jonah says, for that is better than living with a God who I don't think is good. And in response to Jonah's rant, God asks one question. The question that he asks twice in chapter four. He says, is it right for you to be angry? After asking that question, God provides Jonah with a powerful object lesson. As Jonah sat on his hilltop perch over the whole city of Nineveh, hoping and praying for destruction to still come in this shelter that he built to protect himself from the sun, God provided a leafy plant. Let's imagine that it's a a vine that grew up and wrapped itself around the rickety structure that Jonah had built to provide full and cool shade under the hot summer sun. And as Jonah looked and saw this plant, he was happy about it. Finally, he thought something is going my way. Something is looking up for me. But then at dawn, the next day, God sent a worm to chew through the plant at the base of the vine. And and when God sent the scorching wind and sun, the plant died and Jonah roasted in the heat. And at this, Jonah lost it. He'd had enough. He said, now my vine is dead. That's it. I'm done. Kill me now. And again, God asked, is it right for you to be angry. And Jonah said, yes, it is. I am so angry that I wish I were dead. And then God revealed the point of his object lesson. Listen to what God says in verse 10 and 11. 
God says, Jonah, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend to it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it, it died overnight. And should I not have concern for that great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? Jonah, God says, you care more about this plant that lived for a day and that served you by, by giving you a little bit of shade than you do about 120,000 people who do not know me. You care more about yourself. You care more about having me serve you than you do about an entire city full of people who are made in my image, whom I made with my own hands and who were created to love and serve me. So shouldn't I care about these people? Aren't they just as deserving of love and compassion as you are? And, and aren't my people called and blessed to be a blessing to the world, even to Nineveh? Now we know the answer to that question. The question that hangs in the air at the end of this book. We know the answer, at least up here. But when it comes to our hearts, we struggle as Jonah did. We have our own ideas about how God should act. We have our own ideas about how a good God would respond, how a good God would answer our prayers, how a good God would work in our lives and in our church and in our community and in our world. And when we don't see it, or when God doesn't act the way that, that we think is good and the way that he should act, like Jonah, we do everything that we can to, to help God do the right thing as we determine it. In his book, Your God is Too Safe, Mark Buchanan writes, I heard Pastor Young E. Cho speak a few years back. Young E. Cho is the pastor of the largest church in the world. And several years ago, as his ministry was becoming international, he told God, I will go anywhere to preach the gospel except Japan. He hated the Japanese with a gut deep loathing because of what the Japanese troops had done to the Korean people and to members of Young E. Cho's family during World War II. The Japanese were, they were his Ninevites. Through a combination of a prolonged inner struggle and several direct challenges from others, and finally an urgent and starkly worded invitation, Cho felt called by God to preach in Japan. And so he went. But he went with bitterness. The first speaking engagement that he took was to a, uh, a pastor's conference of a thousand Japanese pastors. Cho stood up to speak and what came out of his mouth was this. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And then he broke down and wept. He was both brimming and desolate with hatred. At first one and then two and then all 1,000 pastors stood up. One by one, they walked up to Young Yi Cho, knelt at his feet, and asked forgiveness for what they and their people had done to him and his people. And as this went on, God changed Young Yi Cho. The Lord put a single message in his heart and mouth. I love you. I love you. I love you. Sometimes God calls us to do what we least want to do in order to reveal what's really in our hearts. How powerful is the blood of Christ? Can it heal hatred between Koreans and Japanese? Can it make a Jew love a Ninevite? Can it make you reconcile to, well, you know who? Sometimes we feel that we, like Jonah, need to protect God's reputation. Like we know what a good God would do and we need to help him do that. We need to show God the way. 
But then God reminds us as he did Jonah that he is good. Even, even when we cannot see it. And even when we think otherwise. As we are reminded in our baptismal promises, for you, Jesus Christ came into the world. For you, he fought and he suffered. For you, he entered the shadow of Gethsemane and the horror of Calvary. For you, he uttered the cry, it is finished. For you, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and there he intercedes. All this he did for you, for me. And for all of his children, even though we don't deserve it. Our good God has done all of this for us. And as he has done all of this for us, he calls us to proclaim that message freely to all, even to those who don't deserve it. Because we don't deserve it either. That's, that's the wonder of God's faithfulness and compassion that he showed Jonah. And that's the wonder of God's faithfulness and compassion for us. We don't deserve it. And we don't have to because by the grace of God, Christ has done all of that for us. And so we can say, even when we don't see it, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Now, Jonah didn't say that specifically at the end of his book, but the way that he writes this book, the way that he paints himself in such a negative light helps us to see that too. That even when we're sent to our Nineveh, even when we cannot see or understand God's goodness, even when the world seemingly doesn't make sense, God is good all the time and all the time. Amen.